Hello, everyone, and welcome to the launch of the State of the Tropics Report. I'm Lisa Oak, and today I'm going to be introducing some of the world's most eminent authorities on a vast range of subjects concerning our planet's tropical region. Soon we are going to hear from Nobel laureate Aung San Suu Kyi, winner of the 1991 Nobel Peace Prize and chair of the National League for Democracy. She will launch the report live from Yangon in Myanmar. For this launch, our audience around the world and especially in Yangon include diplomatic staff and representatives of the many research institutions with an interest in tropical research. We also have Burmese academics and educational representatives and among our guests are scores of journalists. They are representing international, regional and national media outlets. Unless they live here, many people know very little about the tropics other than what they were taught in school. Over the next hour or so, as we launch the State of the Tropics report, we'll hear about diverse subjects ranging from the threat of tropical disease, environmental challenges, and how technology and education will develop in the world's tropical regions. Our panel of eminent researchers will also look at some of the questions about a sustainable future with population growth that outstrips most other parts of the world and generates an ever-increasing demand for consumer goods and a fair place in the connected world of the future. We're going to learn about some of the keys to sustainable developments in the tropics as well. Our participants include some of the most innovative thinkers from around the world. And to meet the first of these academic leaders, we now cross live to Yangon in Myanmar to Professor Sandra Harding, the Vice Chancellor and the President of James Cook University in Australia and convener of the State of the Tropics Report. Thank you, Lisa. Good morning and welcome to those here in Yangon, in Singapore and across other sites, including Cairns and Townsville in Australia and online. We're here today to launch a major report on the state of the world's tropics. In doing so, today will become a critical moment in reframing our understanding of global dynamics and of the power and the potential of the tropics. More than 2,000 years ago, Aristotle wrote that there are three zones of the world, the frigid zone, the temperate zone, and the torrid zone. And only one of these, the temperate zone, was a place where human beings could live. Fast forward to 2014. The tropics accounts for more than 40% of the world's population, around 80% of the world's biodiversity, and features some of the most pressing issues of our time, population growth rates ahead of the rest of the world, health and disease, environmental management, the development of governance and judicial structures, all playing out in Aristotle's torrid zone. In viewing the world as a set of dichotomies, north-south, east-west, developed-developing, Asia, the rest, Aristotle's powerful lateral notion of the world in general, and the tropics in particular, has been consigned to obscurity. But given 21st century statistics, it is well past time that we rediscover the tropics. To do so means charting the tropics, exploring it, not in ships, but through data that reveal its zonal power and potential. Three years ago, 12 universities and research institutions from around the world, dedicated to the tropics through their location or their mission, determined it was time to explore and to understand to reprise that fundamental Aristotelian lateral conception of the world. With this in mind, the group set the parameters of an historic report on the state of the tropics. The aim of the report is to answer a very simple question. Is life in the tropics getting better? More subtly, the aim of the report is geopolitical. It is to change the way the world views itself. Today, the work is done and the report is ready. It is a very great honour that Nobel Peace Prize winner and chair of the National League for Democracy in Burma, Do Aung San Suu Kyi, is here to launch this important work. In a short while, we will be welcoming her on stage to deliver the keynote address and to officially launch the inaugural State of the Tropics report. Before that, for our Burmese speakers, here's Ms Thunder Lain. 
ကျွန်တော်ရောက်လာကြတော့ကုန်တီရှိလူကြီးမြင်းများနဲ့အဲ့သေရောများအပေါင်းကျွန်မတို့မြင်မနိုင်ငံမှာဒီမိုကရစီ
are we all temperate enough to make sure that our world survives in the right way? And I'm not talking about temperate geographically or physically, obviously. So what can we do to make our world more temperate? How can we use our knowledge of the state of the tropics to help our whole world to be more temperate politically, socially, humanly? So the world comes down to this. We have to live not just with other human beings, but with other living beings. And how can we help to make this world a happier home for all living beings, not just for ourselves, the humans, who are, who are the bosses, as it were. But I'm not sure whether we're always the best bosses that the animals would require or would wish for. Biodiversity, I think, will prove in time to be not just uh, desirable, but necessary. And that is one of the contributions that I believe this report can make, to make us understand the importance of biodiversity, to make us understand the importance of survival, not just mere survival, but quality survival among different species, different peoples, different cultures, different attitudes. And that, to me, is what politics is about. Politics, these, in this day and age, is about connectivity. It is about inclusiveness. Exclusiveness is a word that belongs to the past. We all have to learn to live together because we are all so closely connected as never before. And when I look at all these statistics about what we have or do not have, in the, in the tropics, I am I'm struck by the fact that what we need most of all is a greater, more, more flexible form of knowledge. Knowledge in Aristotle's day was different from what we think of as knowledge today. But what the kind of knowledge I'm talking about basically is awareness, awareness of what is going on around us, what is going on further away from us, not just very close to us. And that is linked to education. So in, this is a way of uh, a roundabout way of coming to one of my favorite topics, education. Earlier, just before we came here, I had the opportunity to discuss tropical medicine and tropical diseases with some of those who produced the report. And when we talk about diseases and control of diseases, I think we cannot avoid education, not just with regard to how to cure the diseases. Tropical medicine, I, I don't think, is simply about medicines or simply about medical statistics or data or medical research. It is about education of the wider public. In order to be healthy, we need an educated public because the public must take part in looking after their own health, in looking after themselves. We discussed the matter of malaria. Malaria, but I, another disease that I think is very, very closely linked to education, general education, is tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is a great problem in our country because of the fact that our people are not able to take their medication regularly for, or correctly. Two reasons. Sometimes it's, uh, one is the uh, availability or not of the drugs. And secondly is how well the people understand how they are supposed to take the drugs. So it's education, as well as, of course, finances. Now, the tropics include some of the poorest countries in the world. There is no doubt about the fact that affluence is important to a certain extent. Without the necessary means, without the necessary resources, we will not be able to look after the health or the education of our people. So everything is linked together, health, 
education, economics, and everything should be linked together. As we progress more and more technologically, scientifically, I wonder whether we are progressing quickly enough along spiritual and intellectual, in a very broad sense, lines. Whether we are becoming not just a more competent race, I mean the human race, or are we also becoming a more, a more likable race, a race that is more likely to be good to one another, a, more, a race that is more uh, suited to be, uh, to take over uh, the guardianship of the world. Because whether we like it or not, it's human beings who have to look after the world. The other living animals are not in a position to do so. We have the responsibility and the opportunity to look after the rest of the world. So starting with the tropics, how do we look after ourselves? First, we have to know about ourselves. We have to understand ourselves if we are to look after ourselves properly. I was taught uh, as a young student by, by my French teacher uh, that uh, this was the most important thing. She asked me a question. Uh, she said, if I'm to teach John Latin, what must I know first? I thought, now, Latin. And of course, she said, no, John. Unless you know John, you will not be able to teach him Latin. So if we want to progress, we have to know ourselves for what we are. And uh, we have to know ourselves from every aspect, for as, from as many aspects as we possibly can. So if for us in the tropics to know ourselves, we have to know about the other zones as well, about those beyond the tropics. We cannot limit ourselves to the tropics. We are the center of the world, and I'm saying, I, I mean this in a geograph geographical sense. I'm not trying to say that we are better than everybody else or more important, but geographically, we are at the center of the world. And so we have to know about those beyond our borders. And we want all, all of those beyond our borders to become part of what we are trying to do, which I believe from looking very quickly through the report, I have to confess that I haven't been through it line by line or word by word, but I think uh, the report aims at making the best of what there is, building on what we have already achieved and going on to better a better, better places and better peoples and better situations for everybody. So I would like the tropics to be an area that invites everybody to come together, not just to help us, but to use us if necessary in order to help the rest of the world. Of course, a richer part of the, of the globe may question, what do we have to give them? But I think if you, have, if you read the report, you will no longer ask this question. There is a lot that the tropics have to give to the rest of the world. And of course, that there's a lot that the rest of the world has to give to us. So when we talk about the state of the tropics, I hope that eventually we are all talking about the state of this world, not just about one particular area, and that whatever we learn through this report, we will be able to use not just to enhance the lives of human beings and other living beings in this area, but in the whole world. So that is what politics is about. This is what I believe, that politics is about improving the lives of all those who come within its, uh, its area of influence. And its area of influence is the whole world. Speaking as a politician, I would like to say that we depend a lot on our scientists, our sociologists, our academics to help us to see the way forward better 
and clearer. But we would also like to remind them to be more open in their vision, in their view of where we should be going. Sometimes because specialists are so good at their own specialities, they lose track of other disciplines, of other needs, of other specialities, which may be as special to some others as theirs is to them. So if we go forward together with the, in the understanding that we will help one another to know more, not only that, but to use our knowledge in a more intelligent, in a more caring way. So before I, I suppose I have to pronounce towards the end the official launching of the report, I would like to say that the key word of my keynote address for me is care. That's why I've kept it until last, a more caring world. I would like this report to be able to contribute towards a more caring world for all of us. And there is so much that we can learn from this report to make us better carers, to care for our environment, to care for one another, to care for those who are different from us, and to understand that those who are different from us are just as worthy of care as we are. So that is the only contribution I can make to a report that is so complete, that is so valuable, that I can only say thank you to all of you who have compiled it. And I would like to say that I truly respect and admire the work that you have done. And I do believe that what you have done will help us in our work, which is to try to create a more caring world. So may I now say that the report on the state of the tropics is officially launched for the betterment of our world. Thank you. Noble Laureate Do Aung San Suu Kyi for launching the inaugural State of the Tropics report with such wonderful words of inspiration. Thank you very much. It's now time to cross back to Singapore where Lisa Oak is standing by with our panel of eminent authorities on the State of the Tropics. Thank you so much for that. Professor Sandra Harding joining us there from Yangon and also many thanks to Do Aung San Suu Kyi for launching the State of the Tropics report with her keynote address. Next in our State of the Tropics broadcast is the panel discussion on does the future belong to the tropics? It's a big question and we're joined now by some of the world's most eminent researchers specializing in many diverse aspects of the world's tropical regions. We'll now discuss the report and its implications and I'd like to start by putting the first question to one of our panel members, Professor Bertil Anderson, president of the Nanyang Technological University here in Singapore. Professor Anderson, can you tell us why is this report so important? I think we heard a lot about that from Rangoon here in a very nice way from uh, Madame Aung San Suu Kyi. And um, I think it's uh, important because it's the first really comprehensive report on the tropics that I think that's ever been made. I mean, there have been specialized reports, but this covers everything and uh, of course the tropics as we heard is important a lot of people live here and i think you only have to listen to the news every day and read the newspapers to realize that the tropics are in the center of, of the world and attentions and i think uh, that goes back to environmental sustainability very important people then life of quality life quality health education, governance, and so forth. And I think it's unique also that we have this study done by 12 different institutions from the tropics, universities and other institutions. And I must commend uh, Professor Harding who have taken the initiative did this from James Cook University in Australia and others have followed. I think that is absolutely great. But I think it's very important to say we are launching this today.
but it's absolutely not the end. It's actually the start. And I think that is my main message here. And it's a start because I feel we need more knowledge. That's clear. And Aung San Suu Kyi described that very clearly. And we are academics. We need to do more research. I also think we need to do more research together, together with the various universities in the tropics. And we are not very aligned at the moment. And I think that it could be an inspiration now. We also have to work together across disciplines. The microbiologists have to work with the sociologists uh, 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 and, and so forth. So I think these are the, the messages that we have work together in the tropics for the tropics. Thank you very much, Professor Anderson. I'd now like to introduce you to our other distinguished panelists today. Professor Richard Coker is visiting professor and head of the Infectious Diseases Program at the National University of Singapore. We're also joined by Professor Bill Lawrence, a distinguished research professor and Australian laureate at James Cook University in Australia. Sitting next to him, we've got Professor J. Stephen Lansing, who directs the Complexity Institute at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Also, Dr. Rose Adarolali, Chief of the Human and Social Development Program for the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. And Dr. Sakharin Niasilpa, a senior researcher at the Institute of Population and Social Research at Mandadol University in Thailand. So our first question uh, that we want to get to you right now is we're going to take a look at emerging infectious diseases with Richard Coker and tell us about the, the implications of this. Do you think Southeast Asia and the tropics in general are a hotspot for diseases? What can you tell us? Lisa, I think, the, I think this, it's a fab, this fabulous report actually has a thread running through it and I think that thread is around diversity. And uh, the tropics, it, tropics is such a diverse region with ecological changes, ecological niches, um, and a transformation over time um, in this part of the, the world. I'm most familiar with Southeast Asia, having lived here for, for now seven years, and, and, and what, what one's seeing is transformations as a result of changing behavior, differences in land use, changes in agriculture, and all of those changes benefit, most of those changes benefit people through economic drivers, but those changes also have consequences and they release ecological niches that pathogens, that bugs can exploit. And that's why the tropics is most commonly the source of new emerging infectious diseases. So it's a vitally important issue to understand what those risks are why those risks emerge and how those risks might challenge us. The lady mentioned something that was very close to my heart because we're doing research uh, on tuberculosis. So as well as the drivers that are pushing new emerging infectious diseases up, there are also issues around how health systems and how uh, programs respond to those that are already in existence. So she mentioned the problem of tuberculosis and the problem there in Myanmar is partly driven by poverty, it's increasing urbanization, it's also antimicrobial resistance. And many of those problems are caused by humans and our failure to connect with governance issues. Uh, so the multidisciplinarity that she talked about is, is critical to try and address some of these problems important area of research if we are going to be more caring, as Aung San Suu Kyi pointed out. Uh, our next question is for Dr. Bill Lawrence. What are the greatest challenges affecting biodiversity? Biodiversity is really facing some serious challenges in the tropics. Uh, we know it's the most biologically important real estate on the planet. Um, it's a bit of a mixed picture. I'm not sure we're steaming right at a giant iceberg, but it's pretty clear that we're not going towards open water uh, either. Currently, tropical forests are being destroyed at a rate of about 10 million hectares a year, which is about 40 football fields a minute. We're seeing incredible change everywhere we look. Roads are proliferating all over the world now. That it's projected we're going to have something like 25 million kilometers of new paved roads, which is enough to go around the world 600 times by the middle part of this century. Many of those roads are penetrating into the world's last frontier areas, and they're bringing with them loggers and illegal gold miners and hunters and others that are destroying or degrading or burning the forests. 
we're seeing climate change and the specter of climate change in the future. Um, we're really seeing just such incredibly rapid change in the tropics because of you know, very, very explosive human population growth continuing here and economic development and other issues. It's bringing uh, really an unprecedented set of changes. And I think there's still plenty of opportunity to try to move more towards open water. But the bottom line is um, we really have some challenges at hand. Okay, let's go back to uh, to Professor uh, Bertel Anderson now, for, because this falls in his area of expertise. Uh, Professor Anderson, can you tell us about technological development in the tropics? How do you expect it to unfold over the next decades, and how is it going to be different from, from what we've seen in the rest of the world? Well, when it comes to technology, we uh, of course that's important. I mean, look here in Singapore, it's in the tropics, and of course see what technology ha ha have done. We also could discuss, will the technology be different from the general technology? Well, I think a lot's going to be exactly the same technology we use all over the world. But, uh, for example, you could see in energy production, of course I could envisage that solar uh, cells, solar-based energy would be much prevalent here and put much more effort into this. If you're going to make energy-efficient houses, it's quite different to do an energy-efficient house in a cold climate, like I come from Sweden, or in the tropics, completely different technological challenges. I also think it's very important, maybe you don't think about that as technology so much, agricultural technology and water technologies. I think that is very important to, for sustainable agriculture and for water. And maybe we should not always think about everything is so high tech. One of the best ways to reduce uh, infectious diseases from water was to when women started to, to filter the waters through their saris. That actually decreased illness by 50%. So here we see we can be very uh, uh, adaptive. I also think finally that uh, uh, mobile telephones and that kind of technology is going to be very important for education in the tropics. We have learned from this report that about 70% of all people in the tropics amazingly have mobile telephones. And today, uh, with modern uh, pedagogics, we can use uh, ICT technology for education. It's actually discussed a lot that that may be a, a, a threat to Western universities. I don't think so. But it's, on the other hand, a big opportunity for education in the tropics. All right, I want to pick up on, on the point you made about health and fighting disease and put this question to Professor J. Stephen Lansing. There has been an increasing risk of animal diseases spreading to humans in the tropics. Is this something that we need to be more concerned about going forward? Yes, absolutely. And I think I want to pick up on the point that Myrtle made a moment ago about this being the first report that delimits the tropics. But there's a follow-up, I think, which is to say that what it, what it amounts to, if you read this document, is that we need a kind of a critical awareness that the tropics is the region of the world that matters most in terms of both the health of the planet, planetary health, and also the, the fate of humanity, the, the welfare of humanity, as, as Dao or Sun Tzu Ki said a moment ago. What I mean by that is the rates of change in things like the spread of infectious disease or climate change or demographic change, all of those things are fastest in the tropics. And it's also the region of the greatest vulnerabilities. And that, of course, includes especially infectious diseases. The, the tropics are expanding at a rate of about a half a degree, ge a ge what is it, latitude degree per decade. So the tropics are getting bigger. And the rate at which infectious diseases, which know no national boundaries, right, are spreading is also increasing. So if I can say, I want to just actually say two more things about that, because it leads, I think, to the real significance of this report. The first is that we clearly need better framework for managing, for governance in the region. And I think the report can help to, I hope it can help to kind of trigger that awareness. We're sitting now in Singapore. So Singapore is a member of ASEAN. It's 10 tropical countries. And there is a small secretariat that has to do with trying to you know, develop regulatory frameworks for ASEAN countries. There are the environmental staff for ASEAN consists of four people. So that's not, clearly, that's not adequate. And that leads me to my last point, and I'll try to be brief about it. So I'm the director of a complexity institute. And one of the things we study there is tipping points, the idea that sometimes 
change is discontinuous. We've learned that that's true in many ecosystems. We're learning now that it's true of the world's climate. It's possible for things to change rapidly. So when this, when this panel is over, I'm about to get back on a plane to Indonesia. We're measuring methane. Okay, so methane is a greenhouse gas. It's roughly 30 times more potent than carbon dioxide. A few months ago, a paper in Nature said that um, methane emissions are extremely sensitive to small rises in temperature. So we may be approaching a tipping point in methane emissions, which could have a powerful effect on the planet. We need a better understanding of those things, right? If we're, if we're, if we're getting close to tipping points in all of these processes that we're talking about, the sooner we start to pay attention, the better. So I think it's actually quite an important report because it may help to kind of catalyze awareness that the tropics really matter, that really what happens here really matters, and uh, the time for action is now. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Excellent points there on methane. Let's uh, put the next question to Dr. Rose Adarola Lee. Uh, there have been improvements in life expectancy and economic growth in the tropical regions of the world, but what do you think, in your opinion, are the keys to sustainable development? What do we need to do? Uh, thank you very much, Lisa. This is a very important question on an issue that has been of concern to the international community for decades. Um, I must say that my answer is going to be in the context of the work that I do at the United Nations. Because at the United Nations, we have realized that no one particular stakeholder can really address issues concerning sustainable development. Yes, it is true that life expectancy at birth has improved, including in the tropics. For example, in sub-Saharan Africa, some 20 years ago, life expectancy was below 30 years. That was at the peak of HIV AIDS. So by the time you are reaching 29 years, you are not sure whether you are going to see the next decade. That has changed a lot since that time. Economic growth has also picked up um, we know that, for example, in Africa, the seven countries in Africa are amongst the fastest growing economies in the world. However, this is not enough. And as a result, the world is still very far away from achieving sustainable development. It is a complex issue. There are so many pillars that have been to be addressed simultaneously. There is economic pillar. There is the social pillar environmental pillar, and we have added on to that the cultural pillar. But coming to the question of what really are the critical keys, in the process of trying to answer this question, we have convened the whole world to a number of global conferences. We all have heard about the World Summits on Sustainable Development, during which we came up with some proposals. And these are some of the proposals that I really want to share with this group here. First of all, so that we can all articulate and come together with clear understanding of what can be done to bring about sustainable development. As was mentioned earlier on, poverty and hunger is a major issue, including within the tropics. If we can change this challenge around to be a key to sustainable development, I think we would have made a headway. Education for all is another area that we can all start working on to ensure that education is provided to every age group, starting from the very youngest to the oldest. Um, we are now advocating health for all as part of the key to sustainable development. We are promoting universal health coverage in a number of countries. We are looking at improving governance and institutions that can help us achieve sustainable development. Of course, environmentally, we are encouraging countries to adopt environmentally friendly technology in production of goods and services, as well as in consumption. I think consumption patterns have also contributed to making it very difficult for countries to attain sustainable development. You just have to go to some developing countries, and as you land in the, at, the, at the airports, you begin to see things that look black and white. They are waving in the wind. You would think those are flowers. But these are, these are really plastic bugs, which will take generations 
to disappear if at all. So really there are a number of things that we can do together to ensure that you know um, we move closer towards sustainable development. As was mentioned earlier on, we need everybody on deck. And that is why building strategic partnerships will become a critical key to achieving sustainable development. That goes back to how are we going to use this report to achieve sustainable development. And I believe that getting this report into the hands of the people will really make good use of it in terms of informing policy, in terms of implementing policies that address the issues that I have outlined will be a big step forward. Beautifully Thank said. Thank you so much. Um, so many complicated issues that need to be tackled that, that this report, of course, is going to highlight. And I want to put this next question to Dr. Uh, Sakharin Niamsilpa from Bangkok. Uh, Dr. Niamsilpa, by 2050, it's estimated in this report that 67% of the world's children will be living in the tropics. Is that kind of population growth sustainable? Give us your view. Yes, um, a larger half of the people live in the tropics. The UN projects that the population will continue to grow in the upcoming decades. Um, they will grow from 7 billion right now to 8 billion in 2025 and 9.5 billion in 2050. Although the uh, global fertility rate has dropped by half since the post-war period to 2.5 right now. But in some areas of the tropics, especially in Central and uh, Southern Africa. The rate is still higher than five children born per woman. So um, we project, uh, the UN project that uh, people in Africa will grow from 1.1 billion right now to 2.4 billion in the year 2050. Um, such um, high growth of global population will uh, put much pressure to the world in general and to tropical regions in particular. Um, public infrastructure investment programs, social services, um, for example, will be needed to accommodate the growing population. Demand for food, energy, um, education, healthcare services, for example, uh, will require long-term global development and good environmental management. Um, for some tropical states, with strong fundamentals and good governance. I think they can cope with the growing population, but in some others, especially in some African states, um, they will uh, face big challenges to accommodate the growing population and to manage the um, resources and the environment. So I think um, multilateral cooperation frameworks will be needed to manage um, um, economic and social conditions favorable to sustainable development. All right, thank you. I'd like each of you to weigh in now on that issue. You know, I just, it's difficult for me to see the trajectories of human population growth right now and, and to use that, the word sustainable, in the context of what's happening. For instance, in Africa, currently has 1.1 billion people. The United Nations projects that Africa will have almost four times as many people, 4.2 billion by the latter part of the century. Countries like Nigeria, which are already struggling with great social and economic challenges, are projected to have five times as many people. Um, just feeding that number of people is going to require mm -hmm. incredible change. Um, one of the big challenges at hand is whether we can improve agriculture in a lot of places, like in Africa, for instance, where agricultural productivity is not very high, or whether we're just going to have to clear vast expanses of new land. If you look at the, the numbers, um, the projections of how much additional land, of, say forests and other native habitats are going to have to be cleared, range between 120 million hectares, which is an area the size of South Africa on one hand, up to a billion hectares, which is an area the size of Canada, by the middle part of this century. We're talking about a tsunami of environmental change. And so I think we have to talk a lot more about family planning issues, mm -hmm. about the kinds of educational issues, especially education for women that Rose alluded to. Because if we don't, we are painting ourselves into an environmental corner, and it's going to be very hard to escape from. I want to pick up on that and throw to Professor Lansing about what you were saying about methane. If you think we're close to a tipping point now, surely it's not going to take long, given, given these conditions, for us to, to reach that level. Well, we, we just don't know. I mean, uh, methane is about 20% of global warming now. 
about half of that comes from rice paddies. Rice paddies are the, you know, rice is the most important food crop here in Asia. So how sensitive is methane production to an increase in global temperature? We don't know. We need to know that quickly because, you know, dare I say it, I mean, we may have to think about eating something other than rice if it turns out if that's the choice, right? If, if, if there's a real tremendous uh, kick from methane, then we need to know that sooner rather than later. Yeah, I, I think uh, if you've got to change uh, uh, crops, of course you have uh, modern uh, technologies for improving uh, uh, plants. And uh, uh, say in Europe, uh, we have created a lot of cold tolerant plants, uh, uh, you know, and uh, with quite success. And uh, I, I think it's possible to create new crops for the tropics, uh, more heat resistant or drought resistant crops. So, so this is sort of what, what I talked about before, agricultural technology that could solve such uh, problems. Professor Coco, I want you to weigh in on the infectious diseases angle when it comes to this sort of ex potentially explosive population growth. Yeah, I, I mean, we're talking about changes in land use and crops. Um, from an infectious diseases perspective, I think the real issue actually is around livestock production and how we feed people who demand more protein. And at the moment, over the last 20 years or so, we've been doing it through intensive livestock production. Now, intensive livestock production is cheap. It's an efficient way of raising protein. It's an efficient way, it can be an efficient way of feeding people, but it brings risks. It brings biosecurity risks because populations, clonal populations of animals congregated together are in effect or could be, in effect, a petri dish, where you throw in a, a new pathogen and it just explodes. But there are also issues around the proximity of those domesticated livestock with changing boundaries on wildlife. And that's the, that's the interface that is of particular concern. So whilst we're changing the livestock, uh, domestic li livestock, we're also transforming the wild environment. And that boundary is a risk area that we know very little about, but potentially threatens. We know from SARS, we know from MERS, we know from Ebola. These are particularly risky boundaries. Mm -hmm. And then you throw into that mix increasing population, dense, dense human populations um, with changes in biosecurity, and the risks are phenomenal. Yet we know, we know very little about actually how to quantify those risks and how to determine where the, the points that we modify those risks are most, uh, are most effective. And I think that's where the technological aspects come in, but it's also about where, where the research agenda is. And I'd just like to touch on this one moment. What we've been talking about is sovereign states responding to problems. But we've also been touching on uh, the governance arrangements above sovereign states. Um, when it comes to infectious diseases, risk assessments are conducted by the WHO and by uh, agencies that have a, a mandate beyond the sovereign state. But risk responses, risk management, is a sovereign state issue. So if an emerging infectious disease occurs in one country, the neighboring country, which may be at risk, has no authority to intervene, even within the new international health regulations. So fundamentally, there are governance issues. Um, and when we turn to tipping points, I'm not sure that our governance arrangements are flexible or responsive enough to meet some of the challenges that we face in, in the pretty near future, I imagine. Okay, thank you for that. Um, something that jumped out to me as a journalist in this report was the fact that yes, the topics are expanding, but not as quickly as first thought. Do you think that's going to give um, opponents, people who don't believe in global warming, for, ex for example, more ammunition, or will it remove the urgency when it comes to dealing with all of these issues that you've raised today? Anderson. Well, uh, I think, uh, I mean, the tropics has progressed, but there's also a lot of challenges. And I think we need to put much more research I I into the tropics and everything that has to do with the tropics. And uh, I mean, today, I think it's only 10% of research resources that are focused uh, here. And um, there's a lot of universities in uh, the, the tropics, but not many are research intensive. If you look at top universities, most research intensive, there's maybe only 15 uh, that are in the top 500 or something like that. So the, of course you need investment in, in knowledge through more research. Of course that costs a lot of money. 
and it will take time, but you have to start uh, at one stage. And I think the universities that now have done this report has a responsibility actually to follow up, follow up that and go together uh, and uh, try to uh, catalyze such a process. I just jump in about this issue about global warming. I don't know if it's going to cause some people to be more complacent, but I don't think it should. Um, not only are we seeing the tropics expanding, but another thing that's happening is that the warmer conditions in the tropics are actually moving uphill to higher elevations. And one of the things, you know, we tend to think about cold places in the world that have polar bears and walruses as being where we need to worry about global warming. In fact, I think it's the tropics where we could actually see the greatest perils to biodiversity. There's incredible concentrations of species that have very small little geographic ranges living up in the world's tropical mountains. They're adapted, they're, they're thermal specialists, many of them, and they're adapted for those cool upland conditions. They're isolated up there. They're kind of like li living in little Galapagos islands and they've all become unique uh, forms of, in, in, these, in these tropical islands. So they're hot spots of biodiversity. And as these hot conditions move upwards, these things don't have anywhere to go. Their geographic ranges are going to shrink, they're going to fragment, and it's very likely that we could in fact see some of the most massive losses of biodiversity happening as a result of global warming, not where the polar bears are, not where the walruses are, but in these tropical environments. And so that's a, a, a tremendous concern. We should not be complacent about global warming at all. All right, let's move on to uh, our next question and throw this one to uh, Stephen Lansing. Professor, we were talking a, little mo a few moments ago about uh, rice and how it is the most important food crop. Do you think that we're going to be able to expand rice production adequately? It's a wonderful question, and, and uh, I don't have an answer to that. I mean, it's a question about the balance between population growth and the, the balance of uh, food resources that are available. My answer really is that we need we need to think that through. We cannot simply take for granted the demographic progression pr uh, uh, predictions that we've got and assume that it's going to be business as usual. Um, there, there's, we know too little about the possibilities for change, for rapid change as a result of expansions of things like rice agriculture. That's literally what we'll be measuring in the field tomorrow in, in Indonesia. Okay, I want to put this question to uh, Dr. Rose Adarolali. Tell us about the role of women in the development in Africa. Thank you very much, Lisa. I sit here representing all the women sitting here <laughs> and probably throughout the world. But uh, the role women play in any economy, including in Africa, I think is a critical one. Women are involved in the production processes, in the distribution of goods and services, as well, of course, in social uh, chores, roles that contribute to economic development. Um, the role that women play in economic development has been recognized at different levels. At the global level, the United Nations organized the first meeting on women, I believe, um, sometime 1995 in Beijing to encourage countries to promote the role that women play in economic development. In Africa, in production, for example, in agriculture, agriculture is mainly subsistence, you find that women comprise about 80% of the farmers, and they produce 90% of the food in the rural areas. So that is a great contribution. In the formal sector, there are now women who have entered into occupations which were previously reserved for males in construction, in, in constructing railways and roads. If you go to Addis Ababa, the people that you are going to see carrying blocks and sand up and down the tall buildings will be women. And not only that, you will find women in top decision-making positions now within government departments, within the private sector. So they are making good progress and making a good contribution to economic development. However, they face so many challenges. One of them, of course, is the very low level of education that women in Africa still experience. Fewer go into tertiary education. Even when they reach there, they are not enrolled into what we call, I, I learned this on, on, on the news the other day, the STEM courses science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, women are missing there. So as a result, when they enter the labor market, which is also discriminatory against them, 
they enter into low quality jobs, low paid jobs that does not offer a lot of security. Women also have got problems with producing enough to enjoy the economies of scale in the markets because they produce on a, on, at, at very small uh, scales. And also there's widespread lack of access to productive resources such as land, such as capital. In most African countries, women yet cannot own land. You cannot inherit land. You cannot decide how you are going to use it unless a male fox says, go ahead and use it that way. So there are so many obstacles that women are still encountering in, in their role to contribute to economic development in Africa. But good progress is being made. Okay, and so many challenges left to meet as well. Uh, Dr. Nian Silpa, a little while ago you mentioned the development of access to mobile phones and mobile technology in the tropics. Can you tell us what opportunities you see for the region on that front? Thank you. I like the question because I wrote a PhD thesis on telecommunications deregulation in Thailand back in the 1990s. Um, mobile telephone subscription uh, in the tropics has grown by leaps and bounds from just 91 million users in the year 2000 to 1.9 billion in the year 2010. Um, the, the mobile telephony uh, is, is um, a basic means of communication for many developing states, um, surpassing that of fixed telephone lines. Um, so this, this many developmental, this many development states, um, they have leapfrogged economic development by using mobile phones because um, they they require less investment in infrastructure uh, programs than fixed telephone lines. Um, also, the mo mobile telephony uh, allows users in remote areas uh, to access uh, information and market uh, uh, news. Uh, also, the, they are connected to global societies. So there are many direct and indirect benefits to both users uh, and also to the society at last. Also, mobile telephone uh, platform is very important because uh, of the growth of dig digital technology. So right now, mobile telephony uh, is linked with internet uh, and other multimedia programs. So uh, it allows the growth of uh, many business opportunities uh, with the third generation mobile phone and the fourth generation uh, which is up upcoming. So a lot of entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. SMEs and micro enterprises benefit from the use of mobile phones. And also the competition and convergence of technology, satellite communication, mobile telephones, um, broadcasting. This is a new, uh, is a new wave of uh, global telecommunications revolution. So lots of uh, users, uh, business people, and also even the state benefit from the use of mobile phones. Uh, e government, for example, uh, the government use mobile phone to uh, to disseminate information necessary uh, for the public on health care, education, and other services. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for that. I want to direct the next question to uh, Professor Coker on diseases. We've talked about infectious diseases, diseases that have passed from animals to humans. What about uh, drug-resistant microbes? Is this going to be, we hear so much about it in the news these days, is this going to become an increasing problem for the tropics? This is a, this isn't going to be a problem, this is a problem. Uh, this is a problem because we're running out of antimicrobial agents that we can draw upon. We're not investing in antimicrobial development because the markets are smaller than for non-communicable diseases. We're misusing our antimicrobial armory. Um, we're misusing it in the production of animal animals. Um, and we're misusing it for humans. Um, in, 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 and that's, that's in, in humans, if I can just touch on that, Aung San Suu Kyi mentioned tuberculosis, and I just referred to that about the drug resistant problem with um, tuberculosis. You know, the threat there is that it takes us back to a pre antibiotic era. 
That's the size of the, the, the problem. And unless we can manage the use of antimicrobial agents, antibiotics, then that, that is the threat. When it comes to something like tuberculosis, which is a real problem in the tropics, the costs of managing drug-resistant tuberculosis or drug-resistant tuberculosis that is resistant to all known uh, antibi antibiotics is astronomical. And that's not just a, a challenge for the individual, that's a challenge because it's an infectious disease, it's a challenge to the rest of the society. Is Southeast Asia prepared right now for a possible pandemic? Well, that, the, the, the idea of a pandemic is different from, from drug resistance. Uh, it, drug resistance is an emerging infectious disease. Is Southeast Asia prepared for a pandemic? Um, Southeast Asia, I don't think anywhere is prepared for a pandemic. Um, uh, we're sitting in Singapore, one of the most interconnected cities and one of the richest cities in the world. The result of a pandemic is not just the result of the number of people that die, it's the fear that's engendered. And what happens when fear arises is people change their behavior. They stop going to work, they stop communicating, they stop interacting, and work is affected. So the economic consequences of pandemics or the fear of pandemics is monumental. Is Southeast Asia prepared? No, no, it's not prepared. It's not prepared from when it comes to the emergence of infectious diseases, because we touched on that uh, earlier on about pandemics, but nor is it, um, is it prepared in terms of mitigation. Um, that doesn't mean that countries haven't done a huge amount. With SARS, 2003, the international health regulations, addressing issues around surveillance, these have all been strengthened. Um, but there is a, there is a, there is a tendency, I suspect, since 2009, an H1N1 pandemic, for people to think, well, actually, that's, um, that's, we've done that, that's, that's gone. Um, but actually, the threat of pandemics is probably greater now than it was in 2009. We have new circulating viruses uh, that, we would be, that we would be significantly challenged to, to, to manage. Okay, let's um, put the next question to uh, Dr. Anderson and, and talk a little bit about research and development. The level of R&D spending in the tropics it accounts for about 10% of the total research and development uh, from around the world. Do you think that's going to impact the future development of the tropics? What, what does it mean? Yeah, I touched upon that before, and uh, I think, uh, of course, it has to increase. But it's going to be quite a challenge for some countries to, to, to do that. So I think, again, uh, one has to use... Uh, uh, that uh, universities maybe collaborate more with each other within the tropics, but also with other universities outside the uh, tropical regions. Uh, more exchange of, of, of scholars, more exchange of students. So, of course, uh, I mean, uh, that's also an educational pro process. It's not only money. Uh, so I think this is absolutely necessary. And uh, we hear now from this report there are so many different challenges. And I think maybe one, the most important thing that would solve a lot of this is education, actually, because that is the general one that changes people's behavior, changes behavior of society, and of course is very economical. And having so much, 65%, almost two thirds of all young people, and that's an absolute, can be a gold mine if you succeed to educate them for the future. If you don't make it possible to educate them, it's a big problem. So uh, I, I think this is also another tipping point as we can, can define it. Dr. Lawrence, what's your advice on, on how we should be protecting tropical biodiversity? Well, there's a bunch of different things I think one can do. Uh, and you know, what we're seeing with so much change, I, I suppose I'd probably uh, identify a couple of things that I think we, uh, some low-hanging fruit we can focus on now. Um, we're actually seeing most of the ancient old-growth forests in, in most of the tropical world are, are disappearing or have disappeared. Places like the Amazon still have uh, substantial areas, but in other parts of the world, say for instance in Southeast Asia, most of the forests have already been modified to some degree by people. One of the things, one of the most uh, predominant land uses is logging, selective logging. It's not clearing the forest, it's going in and extracting some trees with, with uh, bulldozers and other heavy equipment. Um, about 400 million hectares of the world's tropics have been logged right now. 
just in Indonesia, which is a mega diversity country, no matter how you look at it, there's about 35 to 40 million hectares of log forest. That's an area bigger than Germany. Unfortunately, in a lot of cases, what governments are doing is they're going in their logging forest a couple of times, and, there's, and then they're saying, oh, you know, these forests are degraded. They don't have a lot of biodiversity, and so we're just going to clear them. We're going to turn them into agriculture or industrial pulpwood plantations or something like that. And that is really a gigantic mistake. It turns out that these log forests, more than any other kind of human-modified land, like slash-and-burn farming or agriculture or whatever, these have a lot of biodiversity. They have a lot of carbon storage, and this is something we've really learned. We have to focus. We can't. There's not a lot of these ancient old-growth forests to, to save anymore, but there still are these log forests, and we really do have to focus on their incredible value. Another thing that we have to, I think, be worried about is you know, our, the areas that we're setting aside to try to conserve biodiversity and natural ecological processes in, indefinitely are our national parks and our protected areas. And the good news is, is that we do have more protected areas than we did, say, you know, 20 years ago. But the bad news is, is there's a tsunami of change passing over many of these regions. And what used to be, say, a national park that was connected to other areas of forest and, you know, species and migratory species could move back and forth are increasingly becoming islands surrounded by a hostile landscape of, of human land use and cities and urban areas and other things. And I think we have to, we can't just uh, protect these little postage stamps and, and, and expect everything to kind of go to hell all around them and think everything is going to be fine. In fact, we know that as this isolation process happens, the threats that exist outside these protected areas very often tend to penetrate in. And when they become islands, in many cases, they're not so much islands of survival as islands of extinction. So I think we really do have some challenges at hand. Uh, and that leads into an area that Professor Lansing studies, and that's the one of indigenous peoples. What does all of this mean for them? Because so much of the biodiversity in the region, it's inhabited by indigenous peoples, and, and they're also at risk. Can you tell us your view on, on what their future stands to be in the wake of all of this? Yeah, it, it is a sad and troubling story that most of the critical habitats in the, on the planet, um, the most critical habitats are inhabited by people whom we call indigenous. And they, by and large, have wanted to retain, they have, you know, they've adapted, they've created the world in which they live, right? And um, many of them in the Amazon, right to the south of here in Borneo, have engaged in prolonged struggles to try to retain their rights and indeed to protect the forests. Famously, the Kayapo, the the, uh, the Punan in Borneo, and we haven't treated them well. So it's a it's a key issue. To, we have to realize that these these <laughs> the key critical areas are inhabited by indigenous peoples who have views, who have rights, and, and those rights should be protected. Even I mean, sadly, even the conservation agencies on the planet have had a kind of an ongoing debate amongst themselves about whether they should work with indigenous peoples or frankly, fence them out. And uh, that that conversation should even have happened, I think, is rather, is, is, uh, is, is shameful. So that's an ongoing problem really all around the world, and especially in the tropics, actually. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I want uh, Dr. Adeloglu to uh, weigh, on, weigh in on this, and patterns of aid, and I know you've studied patterns of aid, and if they distort the development of emerging economies. Tell us what you discovered. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, all we have been discussing here is how to improve the standard of living and the quality of life in the tropics. But all this will come at a cost. And unfortunately for many countries within the tropical belt, they are not able to fund their development programs from their domestic resources, including the emerging economies. The original objective of any aid was to give a big push to economic growth and there would be a trickle-down effect in a way that it will improve the livelihood of everybody. But history has shown that this has not been the case. There are a number of ways in which aid can actually distort the economy of any recipient country whether it is a lower developing country or an emerging economy. Over the years, the objective of foreign aid has changed from being purely de developmental to aid being an instrument of foreign policy. So you find that if the interest 
of the donor country overrides the interest of the recipient country in such a way that the policy space disappears. The recipient country is no longer able to focus on the development priorities in their countries. Then there is going to be a distortion. And of course, any type of aid for any type of country under any circumstance doesn't work. Aid will not distort economies if there's already um, strong institutions within that economy, if there's good governance within that economy, if these two elements are missing, then you are going to have distortions in the public service. You are going to have a situation whereby aid will entrench corruptive governments. We have heard that sometimes, sometimes being said that aid is propping up and demographic um, uh, 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 demographic governments. And of course, if aid conditionalities are so tight that it favors the donor country, then there are going to be distortions within the market. For example, some foreign aid, um, food aid comes strictly from the donor country and they are dumped into the markets of the recipient country. If that happens, the supply of that particular type of food is going to increase drastically within the domestic market of the recipient country, meaning that the prices, the local prices for the local producers are going to drop drastically. This has happened in a number of countries to a point that the World Food Program, which is part of the United Nations, is now insisting that whatever food aid is to be given, that food must come locally from the recipient country. And you will find that when, uh, when, when, when uh, the donor country also has got some good knowledge of the local policies, the local priorities within the recipient country, there is less likelihood of distortion taking place. Otherwise, development aid has also shifted in sources. Before, it came mainly from the developing world, but we also know that now the emerging economies themselves are becoming donors to other less developed countries. And we think this is a good development. It is a case of, I have been there, I have experienced it, and this is the way to go. Okay, Dr. Nian Silpa, what do you think the expansion of the tropics is going to mean for labor migration? Um, we have seen uh, rising migration flows during the past uh, decade. Um, we, we have actually different patterns of migration. Uh, we have migration flows from uh, Asian, Southeast Asian states and uh, South Asian states to the Middle East uh, in the 1980s and 1990s. But now a larger flow came to the East uh, to other Asian states uh, like Taiwan, like other Southeast Asian states, and um, also to the West, of course. Uh, for skilled migration, we have seen a lot of uh, skilled migrants still going to the West, but more and more of them are coming to the Northeast Asian states. So actually, uh, on the one hand, we have larger flows of people, uh, but on the other hand, we have also reverse flows. Uh, we have seen a lot of return migrants coming back to their home states, to their origin states. We also have more flows from the West uh, to the developing world. So the flows of migration are more complex uh, uh, during the past uh, few years. And um, the global financial crisis in, in the year 2008 uh, until recently uh, has affected a lot of uh, migration flows uh, because of uh, uh, more employment in, the, in in East Asia and also because of unemployment rates are quite high in the West. So uh, some flaws uh, have, have come in different directions. Um, I think uh, in the future, we're going to see uh, more flexible uh, regulatory regime regarding the immigration policies. Uh, in some states, we have seen, uh, for example, some states in, even in Singapore, in Thailand, 
in uh, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, they are uh, in the period of aging society already. And Vietnam and other uh, Southeast Asian states will follow suit. So uh, with aging society, they will need more migrants. So we're going to see more uh, uh, labor migrants from uh, Southeast Asia coming to these states and also even from South Asian states as well. So many specific issues that need to be addressed. Let's broaden it out now and, and take a look at the main points that we need to focus on uh, from this report. Uh, Professor Lawrence, what's your biggest concern? What do we need to worry about going forward? Well, a couple of things. Uh, the, probably the thing that really concerns me is if, if, from a biodiversity point of view, is if we were in a boxing match with nature, we're not just kind of giving nature a jab every once in a while. Really, it's a flurry of punches. If you think about a species trying to survive, you know, there's tremendous destruction of habitat, there's alteration of habitats, we're introducing foreign species into ecosystems, there's a specter of climate change. Really, there's just this whole combination of environmental insults kind of happening all at once. And it's pretty clear that um, for the survival of species, it's not just the single threat that's a problem. It's the combination of this flurry of punches coming, coming together that's really going to be the problem. And I suppose if I had to focus on one take-home message from all this is this unifying theme of population because it connects with so many different issues and I, and I very much support the, the, the suggestions of you know, we need more education, we need, uh, because this is going to be so important in so many ways. But the United Nations says that if we keep going the way we're going right now, we're going to have 10 billion people on the planet by the end, more than 10 billion people on the planet by the end of this century. Most of those people are going to be added to the roles of tropical countries. It's really critical to emphasize that is not a fait accompli. That's a projection. There's enormous capacity to change that by investing in, in, in education, especially for young women, and reproductive education, and, and a lot of these issues, because they just have such a big impact on that. And frankly, the difference between having 10 billion people and 9 billion people or 8 billion people could be enormous in, for the environment, for societies, for economies for everybody, and we all have a, a big stake in this, industrial countries as well as, as in tropical nations. So I think education and talking openly and, and highlighting the key issues of, of population is one of the best things we can do to try to have a more sustainable future. And Professor Lansing, do you think we need to be worried about food security and, and, and water security? We do, but I want to say something a little more optimistic because I'm getting depressed. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm all the plants that we grow require nitrogen, and we've made a bad job of managing nitrogen fertilizer. We've created dead zones around the planet by, simply by applying too much of the stuff. So that's knocked off the German and the Dutch lakes and uh, the Mississippi Delta, an excess of uh, nitrogen, which is actually a good thing. So the answer is to be a little smarter about how we apply nitrogen fertilizer. But there's a little bit more. I'm going to go back to the tipping points. Uh, uh, a friend and colleague, Martin Shepard, who's a Dutch uh, mathematician, some years ago looked at the problems of too much fertilizer in the lakes of Holland. So the solution that had been tried by the Dutch government was to reduce the amount of fertilizer flowing into the ponds, flowing into the lakes. That didn't work. So Martin looked at the problem and said, well, if we, if we remove the fish from these ponds and lakes and allow them to to uh, recover such that the sediment will settle to the bottom and the fish kept stop kicking up uh, disturbances in the water, then the lakes can recover. That turned out to be right. So it was a question of a little bit of mathematics and a little bit of a little more science really applied to the problem, solving it. And I think that's, a, that's an example for us. I think that the nitrogen problem is like the population problem. This is all in our hands, right? Uh, and if you want to ask, what I think the take home point is, I think actually this report, as I said earlier, is important to recognize the importance of the tropics as a region, right, for the world, for the, for the health of the planet. And secondly, we really need to get busy with a more effective system of governance, of regulatory structures, of, of science applied to these problems, because they cross the national boundaries. So I think we're, to, this is an important moment, actually, today. Let's hope it goes forward. Dr. Anderson, do you think the future belongs to the people of the tropics? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think so. But that is conditionalized. It depends if we can get our act together. And I think if the tropics are going to belong to the, the future, so to speak, I mean, education, research,
collaboration. I feel these are the key words to, to bring that forward. You know, uh, Dr. Sandra Harding made a comment earlier that there's a wisdom and an experience uh, in the tropics. I'd like each of you to answer this before we wrap it all up. Uh, what do you think the rest of the world can learn from the tropics? And we'll start with Dr. Nian Silpa and work our way down. Yes. Um, first, I think uh, tropical regions have shown strong dynamics during the past few decades in terms of economic growth, in terms of uh, innovation and creativity. And um, so I think uh, on the one hand, uh, the rest of the world can, can, can see this and see uh, good opportunities in connecting and engaging with tropics. Uh, on the other hand, um, uh, the tropical regions have, uh, have been well integrated into the world economy and to the rest of the world. We can see that from the growth of the exports and other kind of economic uh, indicators. So it shows that there are closer linkages between the tropics and the rest of the world, more than what people believe. So this kind of linkages dated back to 1,000 years ago. You can see the Roman uh, traders even came to Southeast Asia, to, to India, uh, and Chinese traders uh, went to uh, the Middle East, for example. So we, we are not that far apart. We are much closer. And because of this close linkage for a thousand years, I, I think what Dr. Osasuchi mentioned about the caring world uh, is valid, and we should try to uh, uh, you know work together in a caring uh, 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 partnership. Dr. Adelie, what do you think? Well, I think uh, if I'm not wrong, of all the other regions of the world, the tropical belt is the most resilient, which other belt has undergone or went through so many types of diseases, so many types of challenges, and yet it is still standing. And also we can boast of a number of countries that have become emerging economies and which are within the tropical belt. I think the world can learn from such an economist as to how did they get this far. And I think by the fact that we have the most di 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 biodiversity, we have the most number of people, I think there's a lot that we can offer to the rest of the world. The whole world, for example, is now struggling to find a treatment um, for, for all sorts of diseases. It is within the tropics that they are going to be able to find this because we still have those virgin forests and whatever vegetation is needed. Thank you. And Professor Lansing, what do you think the world can learn from the tropics? I've spent a lot of time as an anthropologist working on the island of Bali. Somebody has to do it. So, uh, <laughs> so there are thousands, there, there are rice terraces there that have been productive, stable, democratically managed for centuries. And uh, there was a time in which outside consultants urged the Balinese to, to apply chemical pesticides to their fields. That didn't work very well. Balinese have a prayer, farmers, uh, that they speak over their over their rice paddies today. It's quite popular. I'm going to teach it to you. It's Om Sarva Prani Itankaram, which means may all things that breathe be well. Beautiful. Thank you. Professor Lawrence. Well, I think the tropics, I think of diversity, and not just diversity of biological systems, but of cultures and of peoples. And, and I think that, you know, as we sort of try to confront these challenges, these giant challenges that we're facing with the environment and with societies and economic economies. Um, we really have to bear in mind that we're dealing with incredibly diverse systems, culturally, historically, geographically, and it's there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution for this. I think we're going to have to basically look at the different contexts in the tropical world and try to come up with solutions that are going to resonate with local peoples and societies and lifestyles. And really, if we don't do that, if we don't have some level of sensitivity along those lines, we're not going to have much success. Thank you. Professor Coker. Um, I'd really echo the issue around the theme around diversity. I mean, we, we often, the tropics is so diverse, but we often also think about nation states as being the sort of location of change and responsiveness. But actually, nation states are a pretty new concept, um, particularly in the tropics. and. Um, what I've been struck by uh, since living in the tropics is the sort of 
notions of soft governance, of how things get done by smiles and not regulations, not European, not Brussels, not Washington. So I suspect that the tropics actually is a, is a, a region of the world which will throw up new, novel, uh, innovative models of governance that we can draw upon. I mean, it's such a transformative um, part of the world. And if you look at the, what the frigid and the temperate zones, they're really struggling in issues around governance. Um, so I'm hopeful that the tropics throws up novel ways of governance that don't cause perversities, that don't cause distortions, and that do respond to urgent uh, pressing needs, but also in a sustainable fashion. Okay, and the final word today goes to Professor Ed. Yeah, I, I grew up uh, in Sweden. That is a very non-tropical country. <laughs> and um, I was taught as a boy, I feel, feel in the school at that time, that the tropics, problematics, it's dangerous and, and primitive. Of course, it's a long time since I was a boy, but I still feel <laughs> that many people in Europe, for example, would say uh, the tropics is problematic. And I think that is very important that that attitude is changed and uh, that the rest of the world can see the tropics as an asset. And we have many examples of this asset in the debate here, diversity being one of them, of course. Thank you to all of you for sharing your knowledge and your expertise with us today. And that almost brings us to the end of the broadcast launching the State of the Tropics report. Finally, I would like to hand you over once again to Professor Sandra Harding to officially close the proceedings. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you for the wonderful job you've done in hosting today's special event. But I also once again thank Dor Aung San Suu Kyi, Professor Bertel Anderson and the other distinguished panellists for their learned contributions to today's proceedings, the launch of the landmark State of the Tropics report. We must also thank the contributors to the report, the compilers, the essay writers, the project teams and the 12 institutions across the world that joined forces for this project as well as the hundreds of academics who became involved. We know now that life is improving in the tropics, but there are still many problems and issues, some huge problems and issues that the majority of the people of the world will be facing in the years to come as the tropics grows, not only in population and economic impact, but also geographically. So now we know the state of the tropics. What are we going to do about it? We are already committed to producing a comprehensive updated report every five years. And between these reports, in-depth reports, each focusing on a key issue in the tropics, but that's not enough. When we began this project three years ago, we set out to show the tropics was a discrete region of the world and one that can no longer be ignored, disregarded, or simply disaggregated. As universities and research institutions focused on the tropics, we accepted our responsibility to work with and for the peoples of the tropics, to bring to bear the power of our understanding, our science and innovation, to play our part in helping to create a brighter future for the tropics and its people. But we've also provided the world with the evidence to explore both the challenges and the vast opportunities that are alive for almost half the world's population and the majority of the world's children. As you heard, by 2050, 67%, a full two-thirds of the world's children will live in the tropics. This is a message that the world's policymakers cannot ignore and demands a rethinking of the global priorities on aid, development, research and education. We believe we have shone a bright light on the key environmental, social and economic issues facing the tropics and urge policymakers, geopolitical analysts and other stakeholders to use this foundation to examine in greater detail the tropics and the major issues affecting it. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, it is clear that there must be a change in the way the world is viewed, not eschewing the old dichotomies, but adding to them another powerful lens, a lateral understanding of the world in general, with a keen focus on the growing power of the tropics in particular. Today, we have made a beginning the tropics was lost and now is found. 
and having been found, the real work now begins. Thank you very much for participating in our event today and I bid you all a very fond farewell and goodbye. Thank you.